Good morning, church. You all survived the apocalypse or the solar eclipse, uh, same thing. And it's good to see you this morning. Um, and also, I just want to say, I think the Lord heard our prayer. We kind of jokingly prayed for a new basketball coach last week. And would you have it, all right? In honor to celebrate that, uh, this afternoon, eat some Tyson chicken nuggets, all right? It'll, for some of you, that's over your head, but it's okay. Uh, about five years ago, uh, we were getting ready to welcome... Uh, our son Zane into the world. And Kendra and I, we were serving as youth pastors in Little Rock at uh, New Life Church location there. And we were loving life. And as you prepare for a kid to come into the world, you're getting the nursery ready, you're, you're cleaning stuff, you're doing all this, this craziness. And we were preparing for this vacation. And we had booked this vacation knowing that there's a chance that we would have a newborn going to the beach, which I don't recommend, by the way. Okay, and uh, so we were getting ready for this trip, and, and I, I got this phone call uh, from a buddy of mine in Texas, and, and he called. It was a really awesome opportunity, and he, he said, Seth, I, I would love for you to come and speak at our student conference, and it was a church in Texas. There's about 4,000 students. I was so excited. I was so honored that he would think of me to do this. It was a Friday night to open up the conference to come and preach an evangelistic message to these students, junior high, middle school, high school students, college students. And uh, I, I was so excited. And so in my excitement, I said, absolutely. I would love to do that. Count me in. And guess who I had not consulted first? Some of you said, God, close, my wife, okay? <laughs> I had not talked to Kendra, and so <laughs> I said yes to this. I was so excited. I get home, and I think a couple days actually went by, and it like hit me like, you need to talk to Kendra. Uh, for anyone that's getting married, it's always wise, okay? Just speak with your spouse before you make plans. And so I told Kendra, I said, hey, babe, I've committed to this event. And she was like, hey, babe, just a reminder, that's the first day of our family vacation. And I was like, oh, no. And in her love and kindness and, and patience with me, um, she was like, I really want you to do it. And I didn't pick up on any of the hints that she was laying down, Okay. <laughs> And so I'm like, sweet, she's excited, I'm excited, I'm going to go for it. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I got the message ready. We get two weeks out, and she had been dropping these little hints, and I was too dumb to even pick up on these clues. And I'm sitting, uh, about two weeks out, I'm sitting at a funeral, and, and the people were getting up to speak at this funeral and honoring the person who had passed away. And, and it was a powerful, powerful moment, and I was, I was sitting in the back of the room, and I remember the Lord began to speak to me. And it was, it was like these people are sharing these words about this individual, and I, and I just began to ask this question to myself, what will people say about me? And then, I mean, it was like the flashing lights were going off. So we're about 12, 13 days out from the speaking event, and, and the Lord kept bringing to my attention this thing that I had committed to over missing the first day of our family vacation. Like, I was going to fly in from there to go to our family vacation. Stupid, right? Like, I, I, could, I don't know how I couldn't see it. And he was bringing this to my attention. The Lord also brought to my attention that I was more excited to speak to strangers about God than spending vacation on the first day with my family. I knew I had to get someone to speak, but I didn't want to look like an idiot. So I, I leave this funeral. I called my my buddy, and I said, hey, man, I'm so sorry. I've made a big mistake, and I, I have to cancel, I, and I don't do that. I'm a man of my word. I stay committed to what I commit to. I said, I'm going to find somebody, you know, way more qualified to come and speak, and so we moved all these things around, and, and honestly, guys, I was embarrassed, and I was upset with myself. Obviously, my wife was proud of my decision, but I was a little disappointed in myself, and so that night, I remember spending some time with the Lord, and I re revisited some of those journal entries recently, and I started asking myself, what would people that I love the most say about me if I asked them? How would my wife describe me? How would my kids describe me? What would my friends and my family say about me? And you've probably heard someone speak about a tombstone and and, and leaving a legacy and, and, and thinking about the dash between the two numbers on the tombstone, right? We've all heard about this, and, and we start wondering, what would be on the tombstone? And I started really thinking about this. Is it going to be a, a good pastor? He was a good speaker. He was determined and, and, and successful and, and, and all of these things. And those are good things. But the goal for me in my life, I want you to please hear me today. My goal in this life 
is that Seth loved Jesus well, that he loved his family well, that Seth ran the race well, that Seth devoted his life not only to following Jesus, but leading other people to do the same. And I want to ask you today to really wrestle with this question. What would people say about you? What would people say about you that you, you, you worked hard, that you loved your job, that you did all of these things well? Would they say you love Jesus? You loved your family? Well, I want you, I want you to th- let that sit in and think about that this morning. It's, pretty, it's a pretty important question. Would you agree? It's a pretty important question to think about how you're going to be remembered by those that love you, your friends and your, your family, the legacy that you leave behind. But honestly, that question pales in comparison to the question that I want to present to you today as we close this series in the book of Mark. Ten weeks after talking about the life of Jesus, I've been praying about how to end this series before kicking off Philippians next week, which is going to be a lot of fun. And I was like, I'll end it. We'll end the series with an exclamation point, a call to action. Like, like, let's go take over the world for Jesus. That all sounds good, right? But instead, we're going to end it with a question mark. We're going to end it with a question mark because Jesus asks his disciples an important question. And the same question holds the same value and the same weight today. It is seven words that I want you to remember and never forget. It is this, who do you say that I am? Jesus is looking at his disciples. He says, who do you say that I am? I want this to be very personal for you today. I want this message to sit a little bit differently uh, with you today. And in doing so, I want you to take a minute. Literally, we're going to take about a minute. I'm going to just stand here in silence. I want you to get your phone, get something to write with. I want everybody to do this, everybody to do this. Okay, I've already done it something to write something down, and I want you to think about and wrestle with the question, who do you say that Jesus is? This isn't for your neighbor. This isn't for the person you brought, your spouse, your kids. This is for you, every person. Who do you say that Jesus is? Write it down. Who is Jesus to you? I want you to imagine he's standing before you today asking the question, who do you say that I am? Take a moment and write it down. Who is Jesus to you? And by the way, this isn't a test. We're not going to turn these in at the end of church today, okay? Some of you are sweating. Who is Jesus to you? As silly and simple as that may seem, it is the most important question you could answer in your life. Today's message is going to be short and sweet and simple. Can I have an amen? That was a test. A couple of you failed, okay? <laughs> Leading up to this moment in Mark chapter 8, Jesus feeds the 4,000, which is a very similar miracle that we talked about last week where he fed the 5,000. The Pharisees were so confused after this, and they begin to ask Jesus for a sign. They were testing him. Jesus replies, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to you. So Jesus hops into the boat with the disciples. He had just fed 4,000 people and provided another miracle. And he overhears the disciples talking about something. This is so funny to me. The guys are in the boat and they are complaining that they don't have enough food. He he overhears the disciples debating and arguing and bickering with each other. We only have one loaf of bread. After witnessing what Jesus had just done minutes before, making something out of nothing, multiplying food, feeding thousands of people, a miracle. And this was not the first time. It was the second time that Jesus had done this. And then Jesus looks at the disciples and he asks them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see? Do you have ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke five loaves for the 5,000? He's doing like a test. And, and how many basketfuls, he asked the disciples, did you pick up? And I could just imagine the disciples whisper, 12, Jesus, 12. 
And then he says, and, and then when I broke seven loaves and, the, and we fed the 4,000, how many basketfuls did you pick up? And they're like, Jesus in front of my friends, you know, like seven, seven baskets. And then he said, do you still not understand? Do you still not understand? I want to say this as we get started this morning. If you are here today, and, and if you still don't understand, if you're still skeptical, if you're still doubting and fearful and, and lacking faith and struggling with sin, listen, you are in very good company. And Jesus welcomes you into his boat, but please hear me today. Jesus does not want to leave you in a place of confusion. He doesn't want to leave you in a place where you leave this place today and you're wrestling, is this true? Who is God? He wants you to get it today. And it should encourage us that the disciples up to this point still didn't understand. They get to their destination and, and the people bring to Jesus this man who was blind. Jesus puts his hands over the guy's eyes and, and he takes them away and he says, can you see? And he says, I can see off in the distance and there's trees, they look like people. And they, so Jesus puts his hands back on his eyes again and he heals them and the guy can completely see everything. And they go on to have what I believe, and I'm pleading with you today, I believe one of the most pivotal points in the gospel accounts in Mark chapter eight, verse 27. They leave this other miracle. Now this guy can see Jesus just fed all these people. In verse 27, Jesus and his disciples went to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others say one of the prophets. But, but what about you, Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter, of course, he answered, he said, you are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Now, as we read through the gospel accounts, we find Jesus asking approximately 300 different questions. He asked questions like, what do you want me to do for you? What good is it to gain the whole world yet forfeit your soul and lose your soul? Why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? Do you believe? Do you love me? Uh, which one of you can, uh, wor by worrying, add a single hour to your life? He says, why are you fearful? Why are you scared? Why are you afraid? Why do you doubt? Why are you stressed out? Where is your faith? Jesus was always asking questions. But the most important question that we have to draw attention to today is, who do you say that I am? We've spent 10 weeks studying the high points of Jesus and his ministry in the, in the book of Mark, calling his disciples, the healings, the miracles, his baptism, the temptation, his fasting, the provision, his love, his compassion, his care, his power, his authority, his humanity, and his divinity. And everything leads to this moment today. Who do you say that I am? Verse 27, Jesus and his disciples, they went on to the villages in Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, circle that in your Bible, on the way. Make note of this. He asked them, who do people say that I am? It's interesting. Jesus and the guys are taking a little stroll. And I'm sure the disciples were walking very closely to Jesus, just trying to follow where he is leading them. And I am convinced that these guys did not understand where they were headed. Because the disciples had no idea at this moment after this that Jesus would begin to teach them the way of the cross. That anyone who would come after me must first take up your own cross and deny yourselves. Jesus teaches these guys right after this moment how to die to themselves daily. He teaches them the cost of following him. They were on the way. And I want to draw attention to this because where they were headed is very, very important. Jesus is headed to the place that he would be crucified. Jesus is headed to the place where he would die for our sins, the place where Peter would turn his back on him and deny him three times, and others would run and hide for their lives. They had no clue that they were on their way to this moment that would take place. And Jesus turns to his disciples, and he opens up the conversation by saying, who do people say that I am? Another way to say that is, hey guys, what's the word on the street? What are people saying about me? And they replied and they said, some say John the Baptist, 
Others say Elijah, and still others say one of the prophets. Now listen, these guys were saying Jesus may be like one of these other guys. This wasn't the first time that someone had said this. And I just want to say it loud and clear today. Jesus is not just a great guy. He's not just another prophet. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a good person. He's not just the carpenter. He is not just a healer. He's not just a historical figure. Many people at this time in history thought that the Messiah would use traditional power and military or economic dominance and and that he would come that way. But, But Jesus changes the narrative. And Jesus redefines power and dominance by serving others. Y'all remember how shocked everyone was in the New Testament when Jesus came to serve, not to be served, but to serve others and lay his life down as a ransom for many? Jesus teaches them that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. How to love your enemies, how to turn your cheek, how to forgive those, how to love those who have hurt you, offering grace and mercy. The disciples tell Jesus Basically, hey, man, these people still don't understand who you are. And then Jesus looks at them and says, verse 29, we have to get this today. It's so simple. But what about you? But what about you? Everybody say, what about me? I want this to sit personally with you today, and I want God to speak to you personally. What about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Peter Peter got it right. And what Peter is saying is you are the Christ. You are the, the Christos, which means anointed. Jews would anoint three different types and classes of people, which were priests, prophets, and kings. Fun fact, Jesus is all three of those. He's the king of kings. And this is what I call a defining moment for the disciples. And I, I pray and I have been praying that this would be a defining moment for you today as well. Who do you say that Jesus is? Jesus either is who he says that he is or he's not. This series has been pivotal to how we as Christians should approach God and how we should live, how we should walk, how we should talk, and how we should represent Jesus to other people. I want you to write this down as we get ready to close. I told you, short and sweet today. Who we say that Jesus is means everything. Who we say that Jesus is, it means everything. It's personal. It's between you and God. I made note of this. You've probably heard this passage that we were made in God's what? Image. We were made in God's image. And please hear me. We do not have the liberty to make Jesus into our own image. We do not have the liberty to make Jesus into our own image. We live in a world today that is simply trying to do just that. Would you all agree? Well, I'm going to make the word whatever. I'm going to make Jesus whatever. And we, it, we kind of uh, manipulate the truth. This is what's happening. This distorting the word, distorting the truth, attempting to distort who Jesus is. And if you were to ask the world after the Super Bowl this year, who is Jesus? Most people would respond with this. That's the guy that uh, uh, he gets us, right? Does this ring a bell for anybody? He, oh, Jesus, that's, he gets us. And listen, that's noble, and I understand the sentiment. But Jesus doesn't just get us. Jesus took our place on the cross so that we didn't have to die for our sins. He died for our sins. He doesn't just get us. He saved us. What a better message, amen? He saved us from our sin that we were going to spend eternity in hell, but he made a way so that we could have relationship with our Father in heaven. Jesus doesn't just get us. He became one of us, died for us, and saved us. That's why I was like twitching during the Super Bowl. I understand the, the, the sentiment, but my goodness, people need to know that there is grace and salvation available for them. So if all that you know is that Jesus gets you, there's no saving power in that message. I know lots of people that get me, but they ain't saving me. But listen, but if you know and you believe that Jesus saved you, oh, there's salvation available today. We don't get to redefine who Jesus is and who he's, we don't get to do that. Jesus is who he says that he is. And if you're wondering and you're searching today, who is Jesus? I'm telling you the word of God does the best job of explaining that. Not some commercial. 
or some crazy person on TikTok telling you how the world's going to end with the eclipse, right? Listen, what a dangerous responsibility to take amongst yourself to redefine who the creator of the universe is. To, to redefine who his son is. If you plan on reshaping God, the universe, his work, his word, his truth, his definitions of what are true, listen, I don't think that's going to go over well for you. And I'm just pleading with you today. That sounds like a, what I call a no bueno. Everybody say no bueno. That sounds more intimidating than the first time my mom caught me cussing, okay? That was a bad day. D- the apple dishwashing soap does not taste like apple, just for the record, Okay. <laughs> I sat at the table and I was spitting bubbles out of my mouth. Would you write this down? My life and my lips should honor him. My life and my lips should honor him. I'll say it this way. My life and my lips should tell the same story. They should be no different. Meaning that people should see my life and see your life and they should see your faith. People should hear your words and they should hear what you believe is true. I want to ask you a bold question today. Can, can non-Christians tell that you are a follower of Jesus by the way that you live and love? Can, can they tell that you are a Christian by the way that you live, by the way that you love? Matthew 15 says it well. These people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. And I'm just pleading with you today, how devastating would it be to get face to face with God and simply hear you honored me partially. You honored me halfway. You honored me with your lips, but you did not honor me with your life. It would be devastating. I've heard it say this way, we will all stand before God alone. There's not like, like Mima who prayed for me. My grandma is the reason I am standing here today. Her prayers, please hear me today. Don't stop praying for your kids and your grandkids. Can somebody say amen? Like I'm, I'm walking in the fruit of her prayers today. Don't give up praying for your kids, your grandkids. I was running as far as I could from God. And here I am today representing Jesus because of her. But Mama's not standing with me in front of Jesus. My, my mom and my, my dad and my, my friends, my pastors, my leaders, no, I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to give an account. And I'm not saying that to scare you today. I'm saying that because that is what the word of God says. And I'm pleading with you to get this, that you would be able to say today with confidence and answer the question, who is Jesus to you? The whole book of Mark, it points to this right here. There is good news. You can know him. You can live for him. You can worship him. You can honor him. And today is the best time to start if you haven't started. Today's the day of salvation. A few years ago, I debated on telling you this, but it's just too funny not to tell you. A few years ago, Kendra and I, we, were, we, we, we debate about really weird things before we go to bed. And we were laying in bed debating on whose name was the most meaningful, Kendra or Seth, right? It's a really dumb debate, right? And I was like, well, who, you know, who's that? I think my name's cooler than yours. So we're debating on this. And we had a Google home, you know, the little Google things. And you can ask questions. Really, they're just spying on your entire life, but whatever. And um, it makes shopping online easier. Stuff just pops up, right? And so we normally turn on white noise on it. Kind of helps us not hear our kids screaming for help. And it's great. Highly recommend it. And so I I said, hey, Google, I said, what does Kendra mean? You know, and we're waiting because we're in the, it's like midnight. We're in the middle of this debate. Hey, what does Kendra mean? And Google says, it's like pause. And then Google says, Kendra means water horse. And I was like, cool name, you know? (laughs) I said, seahorse, powerful, you know, like, and so like, she was like, she was frustrated. I just like closed my eyes. I was like, I have one, you know? And I like put my head on my pillow. And then Kendra's like, she sits up in bed. She's got this attitude. She's like, okay, okay. Uh, hey, Google, what does Seth mean? And there's this long pause. It's beautiful. And Google said, Seth means anointed one. And I was like, Thanks for that, mom. You know, <laughs> what a great name. <laughs> so she, I don't even think she said anything. She just went to sleep and uh, y'all pray for Kendra. But can I ask you today, please hear me. If, if, if I were to ask you today, like, like, please don't think about someone else. Think about you. This is for you. When, when someone hears your name, what's the first thing that's associated with it? 
What's the first thing that comes to their mind? Do your coworkers know that you love Jesus? As someone who lives for Jesus, do you, does your family see the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Are you living a life that is telling other people about the goodness of God, the grace of God, and the mercy of God? If so, awesome. Don't grow weary. Keep running the race faithfully. But if not, hear me. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus, but I pray that you would change that today. You can change it. Because hear me, it is meaningless to read this entire book of Mark, this gospel account, and to walk away unchanged. Not knowing who Jesus is or what Jesus has done for us. I spoke about the tombstone illustration earlier. I know it's cheesy, but it's so true. How do you want to be remembered? Who do you say that Jesus is? Who do you say that Jesus is? I pray that you would be confident today that Jesus is the Almighty One. That He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is the author and perfecter of our faith. He is the bread of life, the cornerstone. He is our deliverer. He is the good shepherd. Anybody thankful that He's a good shepherd? He's a good father. He, y'all, the great high priest, the head of the church, the great I am. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Son of God. He is the Lord of all. He is the Messiah. This is good news that we have access to our Father in heaven because of Jesus, the one who set us free. He is our hope and our salvation. He is our peace and our redeemer. He is the risen Lord. We have nothing to celebrate if Jesus stayed in the tomb. But hey, hear me. He didn't stay there. He resurrected from the tomb. And that the Bible says, which I believe that this is true, that that same spirit lives in you as a Christ follower. Why does Seth talk about not playing church all the time? Because God did not deposit the best gift inside of you to go check the box and go through the motions of faith. He wants to light a fire in you that no man could put out. Jesus is who he says that he is. He is the true vine. He is the savior of the world. He is a wonderful counselor, the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. I know that this is true, but here's the thing. I want you to know that it's true. Who is Jesus to you? Does your name represent his name? When people think about you, do they think about, oh yeah, they love Jesus. They live for Jesus. I heard this verse right before service. This is Paul right to the Corinthian church. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you have taken your stand. I'm not moving from this place. By this gospel, you are saved. And if you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you, Otherwise, you have believed in vain. If you would, I want you to close your eyes across the room. I want to read these Bible verses to you. 